everybody. All right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, dive in. Nice to see you guys. I uh, just want to give a preface that I, I do have two screens. So if you see me looking over to the right, it's actually looking at chat periodically uh, while I look directly at you. So hello there. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to be here. Thank you all so, so much. Uh, again, uh, for those that uh, missed the original keynote panel, my name is Dr. Sean Elizabeth Brown. Uh, I am Chief Technology Officer at a company called North Studio. Um, I will give some more information at towards the end uh, of the speech as well uh, about specifically about our organization, but we are one of the oldest open source shops uh, in North America, if not the world at this time. We've been around for 22 years. Uh, I am I myself have been there off and on for uh, going on 10 years now. Um, been chief technology there for almost a year now. And uh, we specialize in Drupal, WordPress, and all things open source. We also do plenty of React, uh, mobile apps now as well. Um, and so I encourage you to reach out. Uh, feel free to ping me throughout the day here, either here or on LinkedIn. Um, here uh, presented on the screen is my email address. Feel free to email me directly at shallon at northstudio.com. Uh, if you're interested in collaboration at all on any upcoming projects or just want to talk more uh, about this particular topic, uh, go to https uh, collaboration.northstudio.com uh, and mention that you uh, saw this speech and we can give you uh, up to five free hours uh, of free uh, discovery and or uh, development work on your next project or support. Uh, so beyond coding, uh, again, the hallmarks of a, a great open source engineer. Again, thank you all for attending. Um, I thought a, a lot about this topic and, and did a lot of research uh, before diving in and, and really presenting this. So here's the agenda. Um, first, I'm going to give a little bit more of an introduction about myself and my background, and then talk a bit with you guys about the definition of great. Um, again, I think it's really important to uh, put uh, some type of a uh, firm definition because the understanding of what great is is indeed ambiguous and, and that's something we should discuss. Um, so putting, uh, just for the purposes of this talk, some barriers around what great is because great is, it can be uh, quite a, a deep hole to go down. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, kind of the basics of the expectation uh, of being a great open source engineer and, and kind of the foundations for it. What typically your boss is looking for, as I say, or what those of us that are in the senior level work or that are, are in a more executive position are now looking for out of you so that you understand the expectation. Um, I think that it's hard. It was harder for me when I got uh, into my career earlier um, to understand really what my boss is looking for. And I, I knew that he or she would be looking for the coding skills and delivering things on time, but I didn't know a lot more beyond that. And there is so much more beyond that. So I want to touch on that. Uh, I want to touch on uh, what they don't teach you in school, uh, some inter as well as some interviewing skills that are specific for our field. I think there are some specific things that are definitely things that I want, uh, I think are important for you all to know. Uh, and this goes not just for engineers. I am not under any assumption that everyone that will be here at this talk is an engineer um, or is someone that is even uh, all that technical. Um, but even for those that are part of this decision-making process, that are project managers, that are organizational leaders, all of these are things that are important for you to know because, of course, this is your craft as well. This is what you do. Um, and I, I think these are good things for, for you as well to hone in on as far as finding talent that is going to stick around, that is going to stay with you, that um, is good at what they do, but also brings the organization together, which is, is another big key thing. How to play nice in the sandbox and what that means. Um, as I touched on in, in the uh, keynote panel, that it really is going to boil down to your uh, communication skills, but also networking and things like that. So I, I want to touch on that. The burnout factor and how to control it. Um, and then just some key points of uh, sage wisdom as, as someone who's been at this for about 20 years now uh, and watching the progression of, of the change, uh, specifically uh, in the open source community as it relates to uh, like things like uh, content management systems, uh, understanding kind of what the sage wisdom is that I would tell you um, as someone that has, again, that does have a doctorate and has been out along um, that are, are things that I wish someone had told me um, a long time ago. And, and so again, thank you all for coming. Um, it means the world to me. Just again, it's this is a real dream and uh, I'm just so appreciative of your time. Okay, so again, a little background about me. Um, I am Chief Technology Officer at North Studio. Um, I do have my doctorate in Information Systems Engineering. Um, the title of my doctorate, or I should say my manuscript, um, was Motivations in Open Source, a Quantitative Study in Drupal and Academia. Uh, it was the first uh, manuscript at the time to ever be published on Drupal in, on, in the world. Um, I was the first African-American woman to ever uh, publish an, a paper, uh, published research paper on open source at the time as well. 
well. I, I didn't know that uh, until I graduated. They told me uh, right when I was doing thesis defense, but uh, it was a pleasant surprise. Um, I did graduate 4.0 GPA top of my class, um, and I was the youngest in my class at the time to do it. Um, I've been in the industry for about 20 years. Um, I, I feel like I'm kind of a jack of all trades, but really specializing in PHP flavored um, things for the past 14-ish years. Um, I've done Drupal since core five, since around about 2007, 2008. So I've been uh, in the Drupal community a very long time. I've watched it go through a lot of transition. Um, for those that ask, it is still booming. Um, we do still uh, get quite a, a lot of business. It is definitely our primary business model for where I've worked for a long time. Yes, there are is competition in the industry and that will always be the case moving forward. Um, our industry is diversifying, but um, it, there is no shortage of uh, availability of opportunities for uh, good talented Drupal engineers out there, as well as World Word, WordPress full stack in general uh, our shop happens to be more of a react shop but we also do some angular and um, there is heavy competition or i should say heavy discussion on the open market right now as to which is necessarily better or more sound but um, that is that is my background in, in a nutshell. I uh, worked for a nonprofit, a large nonprofit for eight and a half years. Um, I've worked for a number of very large scale companies uh, as well that are in private sector and government. Uh, Johns Hopkins, both university and medical side, um, Acquia, Best Buy. Uh, I've worked for centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Um, I've worked for a lot of local state government implementations as well. The IRS. Um, I was uh, one of their uh, lead engineers uh, during their time of uh, understanding how they were going to progress more into open source models as well for some of their systems um, and did a lot of the architecting uh, for, for that pro for, for some of their products internally. So again, thank you. Okay, so defining what is great. So uh, in a nutshell, I'm defining great as number one, first and foremost, mastery of craft. Um, you know, mastering what it is you do and really, uh, you know, loving and having a passion for it go hand in hand, um, as well as being well versed in a variety of what's going to encompass your field. Uh, a thorough understanding of the history of your craft uh, is really super important. Um, you've got to understand where you've been as a, as a trade to understand where you're going. There's no way around on that. Um, the ability to code, of course, according to the industry standards of your specialization, uh, whatever that might be, um, understanding, you know, that it's it's also syntactic and semantic. Um, that includes, in our case, repository management, um, you know, having uh, code sniffers and code checkers in place, uh, you know, having robust, having, uh, robust pipelines that have a process of, of checking them, all of those things uh, go without saying. Uh, able to mentor and lead and be articulate to the non-experts. Um, and that's not just with other leading other developers, but helping your project managers and leading them through the process. Remember that a lot of times their job by definition is not to be but so technical, and that's okay. Um, there is a flavor for technical project managers, so there is a, a sharing entity to that. Um, but a lot of times if you can get a really good uh, well-versed engineer that's got a lot of seasoning and, and a lot of experience and a proven track record of sex, su success, but also uh, manages to code well. Um, that, I mean, and speak well, speak intelligently, then that um, is often what your PMs are looking for as to what makes the difference between um, a developer and a tech lead um, and, or your, man, your managers in general. So, um, and understanding that there are really three major business components here that we as uh, executives are looking for. Finance, um, so that's balancing budgets, the engineering. So that is uh, all that comes with, you know, the actual execution implementation of the software. And then there's marketing and business development side. Uh, so that is, you know, getting your company uh, in front of other organizations so that they can win new deals, get more business, get more projects to be working on and, and what have you. So that's kind of the definition of great is the understanding and, and practice uh, within those those definitions. Okay, so flavors of great. Understanding that you know you don't have to master all of those elements to necessarily be a great engineer or, or a great part of the engineering process. Um, it is code stack management. It's it's operation uh, OS development lifecycle management. It's coordination of those technical resources. Somebody has got to make a blueprint for the house and dole that out to the other engineers in a way that's succinct. Um, it is coordination of uh, you know proposals, content writing on a technical level, and technical sales. Your sales guy probably needs your help 
help. <laughs> I've always said that if you want, the best way to get some free donuts and coffee easily is to make good friends with your sales uh, and business development team because oftentimes um, if you go over and say, hey, you need a paragraph or two written for you, I'd love to help you out. Um, they want to be your best friend because they know you you have the way to describe this in a way they cannot. And that's important. Like it's important to be able to have a description of what you're doing for new prospects and to get in front of new customers or even existing customers and, and explain that intelligently. Architectural planning, uh, technical deliverables. Somebody has to write these things um, and uh, be sure to present a plan of attack to your customers and client interaction. Sometimes you do have to just take your tech leads on site uh, to be able to uh, give them them, uh, you know, it, direct interaction with clients. And, and that is something that takes time. Um, even if you, whether you're an engineer or you're somebody that's more on the other side of things, um, you know, learning to speak well and intelligently about clients as to how much information to give out, but not too much information, um, how to, um, you know, make them feel trusting with the bond of your organization, but not, you know, overstepping your bounds. This is all a delicate dance um, and learning to do that takes time and you will mess it up sometime. As you learn, we all do. And that's a part of the process, but it's an important part of the process to becoming great. So what your boss thinks great is all of the above. It's all of those things. So you will find very quickly as you work your way up on the totem pole that um, a lot of what you will hear as you start to get into management or into tech leadership or whatever you want to call it more, uh, a, you know, more kind of, again, the bird's eye view of the organization and less in the weeds, at least to some caliber. Um, your boss is going to expect you to do all of that, to get your hands, not to be afraid to get your hands dirty, to not be afraid to uh, give solid criticism. Uh, to your developers in a way that is constructive, that will help them get better, to bring your organization together and bridge those bonds, to reach out. Whenever you see something that you think that we can improve as an organization, they're going to expect you to reach out and start that talk because they're not going to know. They're not necessarily technically versed, um, and they're going to look to you to do that and to do that without prompting. Uh, they're going to look for you to be able to help with RFPs and the sales um, and going on the road to conferences. And uh, yes, you know, eventually if you you are hopefully you're good at writing they love that because then the technical writing that uh, can pass technical muster for for expansion especially for government contracting here in the United States is big as many as you know and there's deliverables that have to be done um, you know, they want you to try to be able to do all of those things um, and so uh, you know as I mentioned on my original keynote panel um, I have a picture here of Gordon Ramsay and the reason I have him here is because I'm I'm a big uh, reality TV uh, junkie of his specifically that which is you know my uh, trash TV that I like to watch but um, but specifically because I've I've also watched a, a lot of him behind the scenes um, and how he got to the fame that he is um, and understanding that what it takes to be a Michelin star chef I think uh, for if, for those of you that love to cook as as I do because I'm I'm a big foodie um, you know and who love food um, and appreciation for food and passion for what you do you see a lot of that there. Um, and I, I, I as well think that that is something that goes without saying for being great as well. It is a passion for what you do. It's the one thing I can't teach you. I can't give you that. I can give you the tools. I can give you the licensing and the software and the this and the, the training, but I cannot give you a passion for what you do that comes from within. Um, and so I think that what I would tell all of you and encourage all of you to do is to find your passion for you. If it is technical writing, uh, by all means, uh, you know, go for that. If, if you find, and, and maybe your passion will switch over time and that is totally okay and that's something that no one told me growing up that I wish or coming along in my career that I should say I wish that they did that it's okay um, to do that it's okay to experiment it is okay especially with the kind of cultures that we have now um, in IT especially with the burnout rate with the churn and burn um, jumping around is the new norm uh, for better or for worse and so at the end of the day um, mastery of craft you know again it's yeah there's you know the marketing aspect there's you as to who you put out in the world as far as your resume or, you know, your, what you, what people see of you on paper. And then there uh, is the you under all of that, that's driving that, you know, as far as the heart of that engine and uh, you know, at the heart of that for Gordon, Gordon Ramsay, it's just a really great, 
amazingly great, world-class caliber chef, the kind of great that doesn't come around often in this world. And I think that's the same for our field is that, um, you know, and under that, what's driving that, it, the late nights for the, you know, the, the food that is on his menu that is, you can't find anywhere else, uh, you know, that he perfected and stayed in that kitchen long nights, got up at six in the morning to start cooking, cooked all day long, restaurant didn't close downtown, down till 9 p.m. And then once they busted everything down, he's still got to perfect the fall menu and he's got to stay up until three in the morning and then he's got to go home to his five or six kids. He gets two hours of sleep and then he's back to doing it all over again. Passion is what's going to get you there. Nothing else. Not not the money. It's not going to be any of the promise of career. It's not going to be any of that. It's it's in here. You have to love it and, and love it really in here. That is really the key to great. Um, and, and that's really the heart of what I, what I hope that you all take away from this. Okay, so this, uh, you know, this diagram that I created, um, you know, what I, I want to uh, kind of talk about is finding, you know, complex solutions uh, to complex problems uh, and address, to address specific set of needs. That's the definition of engineering. And for us in school or in training or however you started or certificates or even just basic learning on the job, you know, that's the definition of engineering, whether you're an open source engineer, whether you're in any kind of engineer, that's, that's where it starts. But you know, you see here the rest of what's in, you know, this this bubble. What your boss wants out of you and what they don't teach in schools, all these other things, communication skills and teach team interaction. You've got to be, we have to be able to get along with each other to a certain degree. There will always be friction in, in a certain amount. And that's normal to, to for certain personality types. Um, but understanding being able to put that to the side and get the job done um, is what we're all looking for at the end of the day. Uh, setting good estimates on your deliverables. Learning how to do that for whatever your craft is is going to take time. Um, and it, it's a skill to be learned as well and it's something that uh, you definitely can uh, get caught up in or trip yourself up in uh, and it's it's good to learn how to pad to the point where it's comfortable for you to expect some small overage but not pad to the point that your clients uh, are going to be like whoa that is a lot of time it seems like for whatever you're asking for right it's that delicate dance uh, client satisfaction with the product even though you uh, as an engineer may or may not have direct client interaction you are going to be held responsible at least to some degree to make Making them happy um, and so know that that is the case uh, yes now your, your project manager in general cases is going to be heavily the one that is responsible for the client relationship um, and and keeping the project moving and that's a given in most cases but uh, for all their intents and purposes the actual product we deliver has to be quality right um, avoiding burnout uh, we'll touch on that a little bit more in a minute uh, dedication enthusiasm professionalism again putting everything else to the side um, and getting it done leadership qualities adherence to internal and industry standards, and deadline and time management. All of those are the bigger part of the equation. And it can be overwhelming. It doesn't, it feels to me, it felt to me like, you know, when I got out of school and I started to really balance work and sometimes had two jobs to balance, a full-time job and a part-time job, and going to school for my master's degree by then or starting to get back into that mode and, you know, just feeling like, you know, pulled so thin, was lucky to get a couple hours of sleep a night. And, you know, you feel like, you know, I got to school and I loved coding. Like, that's why I got into it. And now it's, all of these other things, how did we get here? So talking about that a little bit. So how do you know that you're going to get into this job? You know, you're out of either, and I, see, I keep saying school, I understand that, uh, you know, understand that I'm, I'm saying that, you know, simply because that's the road I took, but I know a lot of you come from other places and other careers or switch careers or didn't go to school and that's okay, I know some of the best engineers I know have uh, don't don't have formal education. And, and so I applaud anyone in any way you choose to do this, but specifically about my path and my understanding, or I should say my uh, sage wisdom to you, interviewing and job hunting 101. So remember a couple of things for, for you open source engineers, particularly like myself and, and many of you who your resumes are a, a hodgepodge of all types of different experiences and places. By the time you were in this for three to five years, in all likelihood, you've touched a lot of different stack models. You've touched a lot of different open source tools. You've touched a lot of different uh, methodologies as far as well, agile, waterfall, all of these things. You've uh, experimented with different IDEs and setups. You have gone through it all. And so your resume 
they could easily start to get very long, which of course be can become an issue uh, earlier in your career. But understand that your interviewer's desk is a resume pileup right now. If you are applying to a position, for example, at my company, uh, on average, if I uh, keep a posting up for a week to two weeks, I will get, depending on the time of year uh, and the economy, I will get to anywhere from between 75 to 200 resumes um, just from one zip, zip recruiter post or just from one uh, similar type of post online, wherever that may be. Um, so think of it that way. Now, uh, obviously, I as a CTO with all that I have going on do not have the time uh, to pour over your resume and read every word for any one of or any of these. So what do I do? I have to look for what stands out to me in the way of what I can figure out about what did you do exactly in short sentences, in very succinct terms. And I think that's one thing to just keep in mind is that think of it however the other person is processing this. You, I, you got 90 seconds of my time. That's what you got uh, for better or for worse. And that's the norm and will be the norm. And if I can't glean from that easily, okay, yes, he or she did Drupal at their last job. They did it for five years. There was a big project here. It looks like they did some integrations. They did get repo management. They did this, that, or the other. That's it. Okay, yes, looks like they have that. They have a couple years experience of that. They don't have everything I need, but they have the top two or three out of five that I need, let's slate them for an interview. If you can't get my attention that quickly, it's not gonna happen for you, it's just not. So understand that and understand kind of that's where your interviewer is coming from. Um, always take, so yes, even though, and I say that to say, even though our industry is, satur is not fully saturated, getting, good, getting people that are experienced for mid to senior level jobs is still quite a challenge as a result because you get a resume pileup and not, we, we have a flush of entry into the industry, but you know, the, it depends on where they are. You have a lot of junior level coders, you have some mid-level coders, good senior level coders are rare, good uh, experience C-level, executive level, open source engineer that have been at it for 20 some years are extremely rare. So kind of think of it like that. Um, ask about the stack in detail. Always take notes. For any interviews you're doing, take notes because it's going to start getting very confusing about what they do, what they're doing as far as their different stack layouts, and if they have different stacks in different places, which is common. Ask about how open companies are for you to learn. Um, some companies really are kind of like, we hired you for X job, we'll keep you for X job. Um, so, but uh, for, for some people, um, it's also, uh, you know, it's a, it's a concept in, uh, you know, getting into this as far as Florida, as, as far as diversifying their portfolios and uh, moving engineers around in some places is normal to kind of get them more well-versed in other things so that uh, they can have longevity and that they can sort of be in different types of contracts and different types of stacks and kind of grow the company. So understand if what, what kind of environment you're getting into. Uh, look for the right fit for you. Uh, like I said, some for some people it is one big project and that is just what they're good at. Just focusing all their energy on that, letting them kind of go dark a little bit, not totally dark, they still should communicate about what they're doing, but just letting them focus all their energy on one project and plowing through that uh, project and, and that's just how they do their best work. Some people are like to jump around and are best when they are well occupied as far as just sheer volume of work. So find that mix and match for you um, because there's no one right or wrong, it's, it's what works for you. Um, if you are not counter offering, you are selling yourself shorter than you think. I am amazed as someone who interviews all the time, um, how many, on average, I would say 80% of the people that um, I talk to do not counter offer. It is just startling. Remember, once they have gotten to the point where they have said, we want to offer you the position and here is the money we want to talk about, they already know they want you. So now is your chance to kind of push. You want to have a, enough of a pushback. And even if they say, you know, whoa, this is way out of the range, then you can still kind of counter back on that. But if you aren't at least saying, hey, bump me up. Uh, uh, can we talk just a few uh, extra percentage? You are doing yourself a disservice because that lack of money that, you, you know, piles up over the years. So that extra five to 10 grand that you didn't get out of that last job translates into then of course that that also translates into your next job and you're still that far behind year after year after year and catching up is harder even if you are starting to counter offer and that can mean the difference over the course of 10 20 30 years of hundreds of thousands of dollars um, even if we're just talking about really negotiating the difference between a couple of dollars an hour so always always remember to counter offer industry standard is 10 percent that is what we are looking for above that tends to get out of the way of the fold of what your last position is, I should say, 10% increase. 
playing nice in the sandbox. Okay, so it is not at the end of the day what you know, but it is who you know. And, and what I will tell you is that um, there's a number of things that kind of, you know, about that, that I want to kind of talk about a little bit more as far as social skills being paramount to craft mastery. Um, in our industry, there is, of course, stereotypes. I am not a big fan of stereotypes because I don't think they serve anybody well. At the same time, I can say based on experience that social skills um, often, and, and this is anecdotal, but this is science. It's STEM technology fields, so, you know, I mean, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, those are fields that are mathematically based in nature. Math always is in and of itself a science and anything you know above that level or sorry that's going to involve heavy mathematics um, is a science meaning that one plus one will always equal two um, but those things are sciences people really are not you know even psychology is a social science but it's not really a science science um, and so I've always believed that there's a natural gravitation of energy towards that concept of things always ringing out as far as ones and zeros or, or one and one always equaling two um, again but um, you know, just understand that at some point in time, the that if your social skills are that bad, it will start to haunt you and in ways you may not be able to, or that ways that you may not think about. Um, understand that uh, your boss's worst nightmare or managerial nightmares are things like, I can't, I'm not good at writing. I've never done that before. I'm not good on the phone. I hear it all day long. And what it translates really into is that out of a group of engineers, there's a very tiny sector that I can put things on with very little fanfare without having to kind of handhold that process. The more I have to be involved in, the less I can be involved in other better, more beneficial things to an organization on a C-level, like getting more sales, like being involved in those big quarter million to million dollar sales deals so that you can get more hours as an employee and you can have a stable job and you can pay your rent. Those are things you want me as a C-level executive to do, right? Because I'm, I'm your greatest cheerleader. That's my job is to, to push us forward and put your, your, your great efforts out on display. But if I'm hearing all of the reasons and excuses for why you can't deliver um, on, a, on, on more than just the coding, then it's going to stifle you. And that means someone else has to do it. I have to find that someone else that someone else has to be me, right? It is a managerial light nightmare and it, it will translate over time into less opportunities and therefore less money for you. Um, and so that, you know, remember that you will be hurt in this equation and your organization. So get out into the world and talk to people. And I say that, you know, just like I, I love dogs. I have a very noisy little Sheltie that I, I uh, have um, named Hoot Nanny. And, um, you know, I, I've said similar to I, I love dogs because I think dog psychology is fascinating. You can learn a lot from it. Um, and I think that just like at the groomer, what the groomer will tell you is that good skills at the groomer, if you don't want your dog to snap and bite at the groomer and those bad behaviors, you have to train them at home and it starts young or it starts when they're a puppy or starts when they're just getting into grooming. Um, you as the owner have to start those good habits and then it translates easily over for them. The same for you practice in your real world if you are still sending text messages um, or talking to people in your real life that with text message speak I promise you you're doing it at work too so the best way to stop or to start really refining your writing refining your social skills all of that is outside of just the saddle of work you've got to do this and it's it's gonna be painful at times you're gonna have big blow-ups you're probably gonna fumble it and that's oh Okay, like don't be afraid to do that because that is the way to get better at it. I wasn't always really socially uh, great. I was very socially awkward when I was an undergrad. It took me a long time to bust out uh, and become really a lot better at it. And it was a lot of trial and error. But I realized that it's a skill like any other skill to be mastered. Just like my engineering, I, I sat down and said, you know what, I'm going to master this. I'm going to do the practice, the late nights, the long hours, the work ethic. Um, it didn't matter what other jobs I had going on. I, come hell or high water, was going to do this you have to have that same drive in it for your social skills and, and don't let anybody tell you you can't and, and you're going to have to go there. And the more you can master that, the more you can, again, have more doors open and diversify your portfolio. It is the human bond as, as Mr. Bacon, uh, Jonah Bacon was saying at uh, the keynote, it's the social skills that are going to bond you. Remember um, at the end of the day, your colleagues and your get those references for them before you really need them. Again, thinking about the turnover equation, sometimes turnover will be on your terms. Sometimes it will not. I will tell you that the first cut is the deepest and 
the first time you get laid off or fired or whatever you want to call it, it hurts real bad. And you will remunerate on it for a long time. You'll want to think about what you did better or worse could have done better or how you got there. But at the end of the day, you will hope you should put a period and move on. It is just a job at the end of the day. We try our best someday. At times it works out, sometimes it doesn't. But getting references from your colleagues, those phone numbers and contacts, do it when the bond is there and it's happy and it's bright because you never know when the contract could just get cut by because no, you know, for all of you, it could be the whole organization or part of the organization or part of that whole contract could get cut. You could all get let go at the same time. Having that info before you get that message, because when you get that message that, hey, the gig is up, the show's done, you they're going to cut off all your access. Remember, they're going to cut off Slack. They're going to cut off your email. and you, you won't necessarily be able to easy, easily contact those people again for a while, if ever. So do it then. Meetup.com is your friend. And again, the human bond is the strongest. Um, I have people that I still work with after 10 to 12, 15 years that have been with me in the Drupal industry back in Baltimore for what happens to be my case. Um, we still work together. We still do projects together. Um, and we have kept working together as a, as a combination of both um, our talent um, and our prowess in the industry, um, but also because we've worked well together um, and we, we just absolutely adore each other. And, you know, a lot of us have gotten really close over the years. We, we go to each other's weddings. We go to each other's uh, baby showers and, and things like that and each other's graduations. Um, and once you really form those bonds, they are hard to break and they will see you through because those are the people that you're going to reach out to when things get rough, when the economy downturns, as it, as we are looking at in all likelihood, I think um, you, to find, yeah, you'll be still be able to find work in our, in our field, but finding the best work, the work you want to do, the work that is rewarding, the work with people you want to work with, the, with the frameworks you want to do it in with the most longevity that takes networking um, and, or as far as to do it well. So the burnout factor, let's talk about it. Um, you know, I've experienced it. Um, I do want to talk about quickly the statistics a bit. 46% uh, of all open source projects will fail in the first year. Um, that means that, you know, regardless of whether you keep on a contract or not, you got about a one in two chance of, of making this actually launch. Um, more than 31% of all web projects that are started are canceled before they make it to launch. Um, co companies are estimated, are estimated to invest now between 50 and $150 billion a year on failed web projects. Uh, the tech industry, as I noted, has the highest turnover rate of any business sector right now as of about 2017, 13.2%, um, even higher than retail, higher than the restaurant industry, higher than the food industry. And I found that startling when I found that out, but I did, you know, I found that statistic in quite a number of places. Large IT companies like uh, Google and Yahoo, average tenure is now 13 to 15 months. That's it, not even barely a year. Um, and but again, that's by design. You know, when I first started seeing Google and I got out of school, and especially my master's degree by then, Google was really blowing up. And, uh, you know, for me, I was so excited because I was like, yeah, I'm going to be drinking brewskis all day. I'm going to be drinking beer all day long. I'm going to be skateboarding around. I'm going to be playing video games. You know, I'm a big video game nerd. going to love that. going to play Red Dead Redemption 2 and then Final Fantasy Remake with my friends there. And I'm going to code and learn all this stuff. It's going to be awesome. And then, you know, I worked for a big IT company like them. I will not name the company, but... Um, and I realized that, yeah, there's there's a reason why all those things are there. And yeah, they're delicious. They have craft beer. They give you free lunches during the whole last two weeks of the quarter. But you want to know why they do that? Because they don't want you to leave. They really don't. Like that's and people don't believe it. No, they really want to. They want to work at burnout pace because what they want is the people that are newer to the field that aren't overly opinionated yet that are have to get a resume build going that have have all these bright ideas, have great energy, great drive. Uh, you know, want to do it, and they will work you to the bone. And they know it's going to be churn and burn because they know these statistics. They are more interested in getting that right talent than the, the wisdom talent because the wisdom talent also comes with big price tags and knowledge of things. Um, like, you know, some of their taboos, like, um, you know, really firm uh, non-disclosure agreements or really firm non-compete agreements. Those are things that those of us that have been around know are really ugly things to deal with that can lead to lawsuits, all of those types of things. Um, so they feed on, you know, those that have been, haven't been on the industry long. That's the, that's the untold secret. In a recent survey, 100% of 200 software engineers said that within the first five years of the, with, that have five plus years experience did that they have experienced extreme burnout in their career careers. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's a real thing. Less than 25% of all coding jobs are when open source coding jobs are women. And of those women, less than 24% will stay in the same field for life. And so that basically means that uh, less than 7% of our industry is women that have will have been stay, have, well, stay in their careers in IT, in open source for uh, the life of their career. 
Um, the number one reason given when they were asked about why that what's driving that is what's getting them out of those fields um, is often the burnout factor. It is they often women feel about how their male coworkers treat them, uh, often related to social skills. So you guys see how social skills, it all is coming back to this. And that's the number one reason cited, um, sort of the talking down effect and, you know, the over speaking at meetings as far as talking over women. And that's a real thing uh, in our industry. So some sage wisdom now, just before we get to, to wrap these up and to, to Q&A, um, you know, this is just, you know, the hallmark, again, getting back to all of what makes you a great open source engineer. So what makes you great um, for engineers? And then I have another slide about the actual organizations to which you can get out of this. Turnover is high in our industry and you will very likely experience it. Get prepared now if you aren't already. Um, understand for those of you that are, uh, all of us are obviously in the in the pandemic and going through this. And for those of you that are getting out uh, into the market now, uh, you know, I understand it's going to be hard and it's going to be even more challenging for you. Um, the best thing I can tell you is to plan ahead financially, um, especially, you know, take a look at things like unemployment. Uh, there are people that I've known that are even in our industry that can't get through to unemployment. It's now been 10 weeks. Um, so don't, you can't always bank on that. Um, you can't always bank on getting, you know, those public assistance grants and all of that stuff. You can't, we don't have that flexibility. You can't bank as you can see on even staying in the same job for a full year. Um, and so in knowing that you have got to take matters in your own hands. And I think the key to that is again, get good tools. If you can early on get a solid uh, MacBook for development, I definitely encourage you to do that or whatever you tool set you want to use. If you're windows that's fine but whatever it is that you build reliably on uh just those kinds of things get solid tools that you're going to experience with good solid warranties on them so that if you have to go it freelance style and maybe it's not a full-time job it's a something it's a part-time job it's just something to keep the lights on by all means you can do that and you can acquire those quickly on upwork and things like that um try that you know get with those methods connect with your peers to find the most stable environments to work um but um also um reliable tools reliable work it will always come back to that i cannot tell you how many times i've gone into freelance positions um that end up not working out either for myself or for other engineers there because their stacks were all over the place um either the docker environment or the docker version that they had was not compatible with the node.js version they had and npm was failing all these really complicated things um understand that you're walking into that um and so troubleshooting that is also going to be a part of the game. The better that you can uh, get into whatever it is, either uh, uh, VMware or a uh, solid Linux environment, whatever it is for you that does that solid work, by all means, you need to establish that now. Uh, so your, your local C-level executive has three minutes a day for you. So I tell people, you know, at my organization, you know, as I said, I mentioned I'm chief technology at North Studio. We are about a medium-sized web shop. Um, I, we have, uh, on an average year, we funnel on average anywhere between 85 to 100 clients, or sorry, projects, no, I think about 85 to 100 clients. Um, of those, we then usually get over 150 pro individual projects out of them. Um, so my job is also to try and keep everything stable, right? To make sure our clients are happy, to make sure the engineers are following through on the, and delivering the functionality that we need to our clients, making sure we're delivering quality work, checking behind them periodically, making sure our staff are stable, uh, making sure that I jump on any fires, mitigating those fires, uh, any of those types of things. So basically trying to keep everyone happy at once. So, uh, you know, if I have 50 engineers and 100 clients uh, at any, let's say at any given point in time, 50% of those are active. So 50 projects, uh, 50 engineers, uh, I've got 10 management team members. I've got a whole bunch of things popping on Slack. I've got sales calls. I've got RFP proposals. So let's say 20 hours a week of my job is internal work like sales or, uh, you know, those types of things. If I, uh, 20 hours of my week is then developed, is then dedicated to projects, then on average, let's say, okay, 50 projects a week divided by 20 hours a week, that gives me roughly 15 minutes a week per, per client or, um, I'm sorry, about you know, 50 hours, 20 minutes, uh, sorry, 20 hours, 50 projects. Uh, that brings us to what, roughly 15, 20 minutes per project per week. Uh, amortized over the course of a five day work week, that comes to three minutes a day. So you got three minutes a day of my time.
That's what you got. That's C-level executive thinking. Once you get here, um, you have got to get, you get your head out of the weeds and it becomes a lot more about the big picture. So understand that it took me a long time to understand how my uh, C-level executives thought. And I, I did, I, at first I thought they were just being, you know, I was younger, I thought it was a snootiness. It's not, it's that we are pulled very thin and that we, it's not like, um, I always say it, it's a different world. Our world is different than a than working level world because it is um, adjusting the framework and the knobs uh, in certain places and then watching it propagate out, adjusting the knobs, watching it propagate out. It's less, I start a task, I finish a task. That's it. I start a task, I finish a task. That's it. That's a part of it. But we're not like that. It's not like I pull a ticket, I get that ticket done, that ticket's done. Um, it, it, there's always 3,000 things I could be doing. I won't get to all of them. Where do I put my energy that is going to make the most difference in my organization? So understand that's how they think and plan accordingly. You want to think about freelancing. I can't. I don't want to stop you. I actually think that uh, for a lot of people, it, it's a great option. Do your homework first. Know what you're getting into. Read books about it. Get a lawyer verified contract. You will instantly become the project manager, the accountant, and the collections department all at the same time. Uh, I did start my own freelance business five or six years ago and learned that the hard way. Um, I, uh, if you want to learn, I've been working from home for over ten years. Um, we do have a blog on North Studio under our blog section about it. I encourage you to look at it. Uh, 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 as well. Um, it's all about, uh, you know, good six uh, key lessons for working from home. Um, but get a, your contract lawyer verified. People will stiff you over the years. I promise you, you will get to someone who will not pay out. It was something I had to learn hard. I could not believe um, uh, how many people it was like I did the work and then they wouldn't pay. Um, so get a lawyer, verify that contract, get those things in place so that if they don't pay out, there are penalties that you already established that they get a set time frame. take them if, they're, if you have to go to court, which may very well will eventually happen. Um, understand that that may be a part of the equation. Um, so yes, you, freelancing usually comes with a higher price tag, especially if you start your own LLC, but it also comes with a lot more headaches, a lot more weekend work in a lot of cases or a uh, possibility of that. So uh, again, just plan accordingly, read up, talk to your friends that freelance, uh, learn about it uh, overall over, over time. Uh, think about your long-term goals and periodically adjust. I encourage people to document their life um, and to take, you know, to journal, and that includes for your career. Um, but just document and, and get a good handle on what you want, and then readjust. If you get to a point where you say, "Look, Drupal just isn't for me," if that's what you're doing, I'm going to go WordPress. By all means, start to explore that. Don't be afraid to go back to school or go back to training. I'm, I'm very big on. I love Code Academy. Um, I love Block Academy. I love just YouTube videos. I love Lynda.com, which is now LinkedIn Learn, I believe. Um, I love all of those things. There are no, there's no one right way to do it. Um, the benefit, of course, of these learning academies is that um, you can reach out when you get stuck, and sometimes that's a vital thing, and you will get stuck as you learn some stacks. Uh, I found React to have, even for all my years of experience and all my coding languages, React had quite a learning curve. I was always great at JavaScript, great at HTML, no problems with CSS, no problems with CSLAS, all of those things, PHP, React hard learning curve for me. I'm still, I'm still diving into it. I, I'm great. I'm good at it, but I still have, you know, I, I still have a ways to go to be great at it. And so I admit that it's a learning curve and I'm still learning in my spare time. So uh, don't be afraid to do that. Um, at the end of the day, positive people doing great work. Again, um, you know, if you are a great engineer, I have known some great engineers that have gone on for years and years and they've done great projects, have great success, have made some great websites. Um, but the ones that we hire back and forth over and over, the ones that get the pick of the litter as the projects they want, the ones that we pull into as far as the professionals that do uh, the really A-list team, the sniper team, as we call them, um, those are the ones that we gravitate to because of their positive energy um, and because they bring things to the table that we can't teach, which is, which is positivity and a passion for what they do. Finally, uh, your organization for save, Sage Wisdoms, uh, for Sage Wisdom for organi organizations, your developers are the heart of your engine room. Okay, so please listen to them. Make them always feel like they have a voice. I, I feel that turnover, a big part of it, became a part of the norm when um, engineers stopped having so much of a voice and it became more about the product and the client and the budget and all of these other needs that are more uh, C level, CEO, executive thinking needs, which are all valid, um, but it sort of drowned out the need for the engineer to have the time to meet these deadlines, to give a quality product, to have the time to test appropriately, to be able to say, hey, we got to pump the brakes here, guys. This is not going to turn out well if we don't pad some more time in. Like having that voice, um, you know, don't be afraid to hear it and, and have that hard conversation. Understand like doing the pros and cons about risk ahead of time are big. 
Turno if turnover is constantly churning in your organization, um, we at North Studio do a lessons learned at the end of every single project. Uh, what we did well, what we didn't do well, that then propagates back to our executive team. We talk about it um, without finger pointing. It's just, it's an organizational view. It is never one person that's gonna ever be responsible for tanking a project, in my opinion, 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, I should say. Um, and so have that outside intervention. If, if even after that, you're having all this turn and turn and burn, get an unbiased source. Your HR does not count. That does not mean your HR department should not be involved. It just means that the function of human resources is to defend the organization first and foremost against liability. That is the number one goal. The rest is all tangential and still valid as the people interaction, but that is by definition not, not unbiased. So get an outside consulting group. Give your devs free training before you start. I mean, think about it this way. If you invest five to you know, $2,000 in a, a one week training session for your devs, understand that that could get you a month to two months ahead of schedule on your project. So don't be afraid to do that. Like I am amazed at how many companies won't just make that investment and, and do it. Um, better to admit you underbid than to go six months without a tech lead. Remember, good, talented leads are hard to find and expensive. Um, so treat them with kindness. Get creative PMs with your options. If you are running over budget, money is not should not be the only tool in your tool, toolbox. If it is, you should diversify. There are Google reviews. There are Yelp reviews. There are uh, being able to write professional references, testimonials. Those are things that clients can provide for you of value to your organization, even if they're out of money. So that's a way to keep things on track without you know stressing everyone out as well. Temperature check your morale and honestly send out a, a, a survey monkey survey at least once a quarter to your organization to see how happy people are. Read the feedback and act on it appropriately. Energy from the top always echoes out and consistently delivering quality products means nearly perfect process control. Um, remember, it's it, the heart of your organization. If a lot of the people at the bottom, all they get out of you if you are a manager is your energy at the end of the day, you know, the higher you are on the totem pole. So you want them to be calm, but you want them to do great work. You want enthusiasm, um, but you also want work-life balance. And that message should be what echoes out. Positivity echoing out is what will help hold you together even in the toughest times. Um, I can speak from from experience from my organization as well. Um, just to say that, you know, you can do it even a pandemic. We um, have gotten through this amazingly well. And it, I do think that it's because of, of the foundations we put in place. place. Okay, so final slide before we take Q&A. Um, for those of you that have questions, uh, go ahead and please write those in the, in the chat so I can jump right over. Um, but yeah, conclusion, code is the foundation, but communication is the true difference between good and great, as I have said, to just wrap everything up and bring it back to that point. Experience almost always trumps training. Um, I won't say always, but um, what you bring to the table as far as sage experience is always gonna, is gonna generally be what catches my eye more than necessarily school. So for those of you who, you know, aren't, uh, you know, don't, for who academia is just not for you or two to four years of school for whatever reason is not for you, whether financially or other reasons, that's okay. You will have still have no problems getting a job um, if you can at least start with some samples, building your own portfolio from scratch and getting a junior level coding job, um, getting a good mentor. Find a mentor is key. And you do that through meetups and things like that. Find somebody in your industry that will help take you under their wing. Um, and that's also a big part of it. Master your social skills. Aim to acquire new stack related skill set. I'd say at least uh, on a moderate level by every two to three years, if not more so by possible. More uh, when you're just getting into it as you get. I've already built a resume. It's less vital um, because your experience will, will build out on other things. But uh, don't forget to, to keep up on, on your uh, world, whatever your specialization is. Learn from failures failures, and take them to in stride. You, you can't have success without failure along the way. All, again, look at the statistics. It is inevitable um, and it won't just be you. And um, know when to seek greener pastures. At the end of the day, if you are stressed out all the time, as I said before, every day can't be a fire or an emergency if that's the environment you're in. And after communicating with those, the powers that be as engineers, if you're not finding that work-life balance, if every day is a fire and it isn't just relegated to the production launches and things like that or production failure, uh, if, if it's every day and they're not getting you out of it, your health and well-being as a human being can't be replaced. You can get another job. You can't get another you. And neither can the people in your life that really care about you. So I would always say it comes back to you and your happiness. Um, don't be afraid to seek greener pastures. It's it's now industry standard. Um, always talk to your management team first to try to mitigate. But that's um, 
So that's that's my conclusion. So thank you guys. Um, now I'm I, I'm going to take a look at, at some questions here. Um, one person asked, uh, does the high turnover rate make it more acceptable to have a resume with lots of job movement? Um, I would tell you that the way that I do my resume, because as you can imagine, as I've said, you know, I've been around the, the block a lot myself, um, is that um, I uh, basically anything that existed under my LLC, um, I, I kind of just put there as a as a footnote as far as um, you know it was, it's SBIT solutions and then uh, you know you know past or present clients and then I list you know the clients that I've had and just give a range for how long the, the LLC has been open. That's how I prevent my resume be, from becoming kind of just, you know, jump around to go-go. Um, I always then, if people ask, because um, I do break some of them out that kind of overlap with that time for specific reasons. For example, I once had public trust uh, security clearance, and that's something I break out, even though that was freelance, because that's something uh, interviewers in the DC metro area, of course, want to know, uh, separate from just who I worked for. Um, and so that's broken out. And so if they ask, hey, this looks like a lot of hopping, and I say, yeah, because I I was working on my mass, I mean, my, my doctorate at the time, um, and I needed the flexibility of being able to, uh, you know, have a flexible schedule, have a job that was going to allow me to work odd hours, um, because otherwise I was going to have every waking moment dedicated to school on my weekends. I'd have no social life. All of my time would be work and school. Um, so, uh, you know, that's how I explain it. I think that having a good explanation for it as well is just the most valid thing. I have yet to get serious kickback after that. Um, but yeah, I do think truncating it under an LLC can help you out there. Um, and that's part of why I encourage you, other than just the tax reasons, um, encouraging you to start up an LLC or, or however you want to start up your own small business um, can be helpful. Um, but yeah, just it depends on what you're applying for as well. I do think having at least in the beginning of your career, um, a solid two to three years in any one uh, place is vital. I do think that moniker or that old, uh, you know, sort of sage wisdom that I've heard when I was coming up is still valid. Um, and after you get that two to three years under your belt of stability, you can then build on that and say, okay, you know what, I've proven that I can stay in one place for a while. I've gotten some in the saddle time. I've learned about just the basics of working in a career oriented field as far as kind of the interpersonal stuff and, um, you know, what it is to be a salaried employee and things like that. Um, but and then going on to, to more freelance things. So um, as long as you can kind of triage it within reason that it's valid. Okay, so other questions. Um, one good way to, um, I'm sorry, how important do you think writing documentation is for a junior engineer? I apologize if I missed this, I came later. Um, I think that you should start uh, even on your junior level learning how to do this because it, that it takes years to master as well. Writing takes years to master like anything else. I write at a doctoral level because I've been writing for, since you know, undergrad and then my master's and then my doctorate and then writing on the job as well a lot. And so getting through that, you know, and I've gotten so good at it. That's part of why, you know, we get new contracts is that the RFPs we get, you know, it's it's that solid writing that gets them being able to speak intelligently about technical terms in a way that's going to come across succinctly. Um, so yes, practice now. The younger or earlier in your career you can practice, the more time you have to get good at it. And, and that's the real key is that how much time you want to put, you know, how much time you're going to have. And um, you're going to have more competition as you get in your career. You're going to have more people competing for those positions. So the quicker you can get in it, the better. It can only, it can't hurt you. It, you know, learning, it, knowledge can never hurt you, can only help you. Um, so yes. Um, and then uh, do, do, do you have specific advice for open source developers or people interested in working with open communities in terms of job hunting resources, people to get to know, et cetera? Uh, yes, as I uh, made note of is that meetups and conferences are the best way to build those bonds. Um, and, and that I don't, I have, I, there is no, in my opinion, better way to connect uh, with the people of your industry because that the answer to your question is that that's always changing. Like every year, there's going to be a new someone or something like this. You know, this year we were going to myself was going to do obviously some big conferences and be on the road a lot more. We're still planning some other big ones and all things open source. We also also want to definitely plan to make an appearance there. We're still talking about that. Um, but yeah, those are the the ways to do it. Shaking those hands um, because the, for us as organizations, what I'll tell you guys, and, and this is in the truth of all transparency, is that a lot of times this is why we do these things. I think people think that there's a monetary component to this. And sometimes there is for lead generation, but it's also really to talk to you all, to talk to our industry, to connect with you all. What are you experiencing? What do you think? Uh, you know, do you, if you agree or disagree, I want to hear that. And, you know, it's okay to, to have those disagreements. It's okay to have passionate disagreements. You only learn by those conversations and connecting. But your local meetups are the where to, where to start because your local meetups, you can start doing presentations. That's how 
I started. I, when I was in Baltimore, I just moved to Reston, Virginia, for those that know the DC metro area about, uh, uh, about a, almost a year ago now. and uh, But I was in Baltimore for the past 18 years. Again, UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore Cam Campus was my alma mater. Uh, UM, University of Maryland Global Campus was my master's degree program. So my stomping grounds was Baltimore. Um, and that's where my Drupal circle was from. That's where we all came up in the industry together. And it wasn't just meetups. Meetups where we met a lot of them, though. Conferences, um, meeting up together. Hey, you know so-and-so, I know so-and-so. We're going out for a beer after the conference. You want a cocktail? I mean, that's how we started. Um, and then we just kept networking. Hey, as you know, job market got worse, the great recession that we had, that was a hard time. I, I was a part of that. That was when Drupal, I was really getting first getting into Drupal, but my first Drupal intranet during that downturn, 2007, 2008. Um, and we got each other through it. Again, the job market and recruiters and all that may or may not get you through it, but the people you know as far as, hey, Kristen, I'm Low on work, you know anybody? You're the a graphic designer. You know anybody that's looking for a dev? And they, she says, "Yeah, girl, come on, I'll help you." That's how you make those connections, um, and you learn from from those those types of connections. And, and she's gone on to now become uh, one of the top uh, full stack. I'm sorry, the, one of the top graphic designers uh, in North America. So um, you know that's that's how you do it. Um, okay, other questions. Uh, let's see. I don't see any other questions. Um, I'll give you guys a minute to write any more in if you have them. Um, otherwise, um, I will just talk a little bit more about just, I guess, a, a few other key points from an organizational standpoint, um, you know, and just sort of, I guess, again, sage wisdom for any of you that uh, want to get more information on this stuff. Um, we do, I do have, a, we are writing a blog, have written a blog series at North Studio specifically about uh, open source and how we're getting through the pandemic uh, as an open source source shop, um, talking about uh, how we um, are networking with our engineers to put things in place to ensure uh, that we are both financially sound as well as stable as an organization for them as far as uh, their sake in the contracts that we use and you are the, the contracts that we uh, pay, ban with but uh, we have been fortunate we uh, you know have had a great team um, we have stay, stayed stable um, we have not uh, had turnover and um, either in clients and in, or engineering and uh, it's been a real blessing and I think that what I've learned from this is that it can be done um, and again I encourage if you guys want to talk about more about how it can be done or how we do it specifically um, or how we have you know really kind of gotten ourselves to a place where we've gotten to a place uh, sorry gotten stable projects reliably out the door that stay within budget um, that use great talent reliably um, I feel feel free to reach out to me personally again this is my contact info um it is shallon at northstudio.com is up on the screen um you know feel free to take a look at either the press release um also this uh link uh, as well uh will take you to where you can uh get on our mailing list uh sign up for more information uh or even reach out to myself um if you want to schedule uh private conversations to just talk uh, i'm happy to I, I love to mentor I, I love to just talk to organizations about uh what they're doing in their world how we can help them as an open source shop um, even with uh, as more people are progressing to, uh, you know, looking uh, at open source uh, as the way of the future, looking to get away from proprietary licenses, understanding now that the progression to online work, as many of us have been more and more forced to engage in, uh, has gotten people into thinking about working from home. Those even the most stubborn of organizations that were very much an in-person model, understanding that, you know, tools like we use like Slack and uh, Google Drive and, you know, all of those types of things uh, and Zoom and all of that, like how to get people coordinated uh, for remote desktop support more, um, you know, how much is too much communication, some communication etiquette, if you are rookies at all of those, or if any of your organization wants to know, hey, Shallon, where do we start even thinking about open source? Where do we even start with thinking how to approach these projects, whether large or small? I do encourage you to reach out. Um, we are also looking to uh, start our own video series as well, that where I will be doing more of these types of talks and uploading them um, uh, on to a YouTube um, account uh, as well. So uh, again, thank you guys uh, so, so much. Um, I will uh, let you all go now so you can now bounce over to uh, your, your next conference. I think I got all uh, a lot of those a lot of your questions. I think I got all of your questions. So uh, again, it's been a real honor. Uh, and uh, thank you so much. Have an excellent day. Stay safe. Uh, have a great one.